This is The Baseline, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Welcome everybody, you're tuned to The Baseline, Cali Warnshaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Our post-NBA All-Star Weekend coverage, Cali Warnshaw, repping out of not Fort Lauderdale, Florida. My man doing it big. He took the red carpet all the way out there to LAX. And as we speak, my man is still out there touching down um, out there in La La Land. What's good, brother? I'm good, man. You know, great to have had an opportunity to attend some of the LA All-Star Game events, man. But to a lot of fans and listeners who've been definitely holding me down, um, you know, on Twitter and social media as I've attended a couple of things out here in LA, I've um, had an opportunity to really just get, in, get ingrained in what's going on and in, in, in the culture of the NBA atmosphere with All-Star Weekend. I mean, there's something always alluring about the pageantry regarding NBA All-Star Weekend. Um, I've lived it. You've lived it. And, you know, it. it's something that if you're not, if you haven't experienced it, I would tell you that it is something that you should do. Whether you are an, a, you know, an avid spe- a sports fan, specific, you know, specifically NBA, or just in general, someone that wants to experience something different, um, this is you know, something like a three-day weekend, but, you know, more so, it's like four, given, you know, the events and everything that's taking place. But when a city holds NBA All-Star Weekend, like Los Angeles, maybe like Vegas or Chicago or New York, uh, it, it's it's pageantry, man. It's 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 kind of like larger than life. Um, that's not to say that other cities don't do it as good as some of the big cities, but you'd be hard-pressed not to find something awe-aspiring, just, you know, larger than life. The NBA just does an excellent job of showcasing not just the All-Stars, but showcasing a lot of what the NBA has been involved in for so many years, and they do it all in the focal point of that NBA All-Star weekend, and I think it's just great that you had an opportunity to be out there because while most people are still fixated on things like NBA All-Star night and the NBA All-Star game, there was definitely activities and events that were happening that didn't get as much press, but certainly had as much impact with regards to the NBA. Uh, I think that's a great point. It's I, I'll give share a quick story. You know, I Ubered to a lot of different events and things that were happening out in, at All Star Weekend, and even the people in LA, like the Uber drivers, you know, and, and of various ages and you know makes and models, if you will, you know, their various backgrounds. Uh, they were just like, well, we yeah, we knew All Star Weekend was here, but we thought it was all kind of in you know confined to Staples Center, and you know I even had to educate people that were there, that live in the city, that that, that you know they didn't understand what it was. Like, there's just so many surrounding events that that the league is a part of. Uh, all the brands that this support the league, from American Express to Adidas and Nike, and all of those you know all those sneaker brands and all the players with their individual contracts as well too. There's a hundred and one different activations that take place at an All Star Weekend, so. I advise any fan um, who has an opportunity, uh, don't be discouraged if you don't get to go to, you don't get tickets to All-Star Saturday night or the Celebrity Game or the All-Star Game specifically. You can still go to an All-Star Weekend in whatever city and have an amazing time because there's just so many free events that you can attend that are that are being hosted by the different brands and activations that they're trying to do throughout the weekend. You know, and one of the other things too, actually, to add on top of your point, Shaw, and, and again, this is something that we have noticed as well too by the bigger companies. Part of the reason why they also, you know, sponsor and solicit a lot of these events is because, again, they're broadening the brand. It's, you know, a lot of people that tend to affiliate, you know, Steph Curry only with Under Armour and they, they only affiliate, you know, um, James Harden with Adidas. But part of this is also the affiliations and the marketing um, uh, strategies that they have in other fields. So not I mean, we know how the NBA is from a sports front, but also from a fashion front, also from, uh, from other ventures, digital, you know, Sony, all of these major companies want a piece of NBA all-star weekend. You'd be hard pressed not to find something that is a part of your niche. You may not be all about basketball, but you may be about video games. Don't tell me Xbox and, and PlayStation won't be out there doing something that might tickle your fancy. And so I think that's one of the great things about NBA All-Star Weekend. Adam Silver, again, he's carried the he's carried the mantle. He's, you know, taken the torch. And I'm sure that, you know, at some point, you know, David Stern probably had said to himself, well, you know, this is probably as good as it gets. 
No, he he <laughs> handed it to someone who's very progressive, uh, forward thinking, and a person like Adam Silver, and he's putting his hands in different pots, and all of that, all of that is basically again globalizing the brand of the NBA. And now we're talking about NBA All Star Weekend, not just where it's only fixated on just the stars. Yes, the stars make up the bulk of it because of the names and the game that they bring to the table. But there's now so many other elements in which the NBA has their hands in. And it just, again, highlights and emulates so much more of where the community can be involved in. And it, it actually flourishes. Everybody now is eating off of that plate. And I think that that's just great. And it's great, especially because it's not just sitting in one city. Next year, it's going to be in Charlotte. And so now Charlotte gets to eat. Hopefully, Charlotte gets its act together. There's a lot of things going on politically that has made the NBA over the last couple of years very, you know, estranged with them. But they get their act together. They're going to be eating off very lovely in uh, Steph Curry's hometown. Yeah, I think so, for sure. And, you know, the final point, well, not the final point, but one other point I'll add on to that as well, too, is like, you know, you touched on it. There really is something for everybody. So whether you're a true basketball junkie or not, uh, like this All-Star Weekend was heavily focused on the the culture, the art, and the music that impacts the NBA on a general, uh, in general, rather. It wasn't just about, okay, you know, dribble a ball, go try to shoot through and dunk the basketball. I mean, they had some of those interactives and things for like that. For uh, and, you know, Shaw, it's, and sorry to interrupt, Shaw. Sorry, we, uh, you know, my apologies if maybe that may have disappointed Laura Ingraham uh, if that's all that they were supposed to be doing this weekend. I'm sorry. You know, but go ahead. Yeah, she's completely, completely shot out and off her rocker. But yeah, in, in general, you really do see the opportunities to just, you know, be ingrained and, and, and find a niche for yourself um, and something that you can be excited about one way or the other. Like I said, Music was was heavily involved. I, I got to see Kendrick Lamar like up close, like literally like five to seven feet away. Um, you know, he was at a Nike event from Childish Cambino and Twenty One Savage and the ASAP Fergs of the world and Little Uzi Vert. You know, not even music that I listened to per se, but like all those artists were in town doing their thing. And then a lot of a lot about the influencers, YouTubers um, that are very popular right now in that space. So uh, again. You can definitely learn something from by attending an All Star Weekend and make some great networking contacts. I'm um, especially in a city like LA because there's, you know, that's that is a city of stars already. And I can't even tell you, even my Uber rides, all my Uber and Lyft rides, they were pretty exciting. I got to meet some really interesting, cool people um, that live in the city of Los Angeles. All right, so let's go ahead and you know let's let's kind of round this out nicely and let's talk about you know the NBA All Star Weekend itself. You know, what are your takeaways from what took place NBA All-Star Night? We'll start with All-Star Night and then, you know, we'll shift our focus to the NBA All-Star Game, which was a, which actually was a very exciting basketball game. Um, I, I'm still a little leery about the whole concept of, you know, Team Steph and Team LeBron. I, I think maybe doing that in itself, Shaw, uh, helped to amp up a little bit of the interest in 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 their abilities to put this these teams together and to, to go out there and play on the court um, I'm still maybe a little bit more of the old school where I still believe you could have gotten the same kind of quality from an East versus West type of situation. But guess what? We're trending in a different direction in the NBA. And so as we continue to change and, you know, kind of make shift rules in the way that we're taking in these type of events, as we talk about NBA All-Star Night, what, did, what are the things that stood out to you more than anything from, from highlighting that evening? What You know what I'm saying? Leaning on the... Highlight of the highlights to the, uh, all right, well, you know, I can't wait for this to be done. Well, I mean, yeah, if you're talking about All-Star Saturday night, you know, the dunk contest, three-point contest, skills challenge, and things like that. Yeah, it was tough. You know, um, I, I felt some type of way because there was an event and some some friends that I kind of wanted to to catch up with. But at my duty as an NBA fan, I felt like, okay, well, even if, it, even if it's mundane on Saturday night, I have to watch it. Like, I have to kind of just grit and bear it and and figure it out. Um, and, and I think in some ways it was disappointing. Um, you know, the three point contest, which had been, been kind of carrying Saturday night for, for the most part for the last, I'd say maybe three of the last four all-star games with the exception of maybe the Aaron Gordon, and Zach Levine dunk offs, uh, you know, three point competition has been amazing. And this year it really did kind of fall short of, of, of what it had been in previous years, but shout out to Devin Booker, you know, who put up a great final round, uh, with the 28, I think he had, uh, to, to, to go ahead and capture the, capture the three point crown, crown, if you will, too. 
Um, and then, you know, it was a night for the underdog, too. If you look about it from from the skill challenge standpoint, you know, Spencer Dinwiddie going out there and, and capturing that. And I think, you know, for the mainstream public who have no idea what who Dinwiddie was or is and uh, getting to see him on that stage and that platform and him being able to make a name for himself with a great season that he's had in Brooklyn thus far. And I hope, you know, he finished his last, you know, whatever, 20 plus games strong as well, too. Uh, that 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 was great. That was an exciting story. There was something interesting, what I, at least from what I was watching, um, the skills challenge. I, I I think when the when the skills challenge was altered and, you know, and then, you know, it started to the rules started to be reinforced. I think, you know, there was a little bit of a seriousness to it. Um, I just felt like some of the participants didn't really take it as serious as maybe say the Spencer Dimwitty. And I, I don't want to highlight too much into this because I feel like if you're someone like a Spencer Dimwitty, this is an opportunity. This is a platform for you to make a name for yourself in an otherwise albatross type NBA, right? You're either, you're either a first round draft pick lottery pick you know and you make your name for yourself or if your name gets mentioned if you're somebody that comes out of the woodworks out of nowhere and builds up a a, a rep for yourself you know you could fizzle out very quickly so usually you have these little platforms like the skills challenge the slam dunk contest and maybe even the three-point contest to help build yourself up is to kind of be a household name in the nba and I think maybe that's in my opinion, Shaw, you know, and not to to steal part of your thunder. I think some of the, the participants that were in the skills challenge, I just don't think took it seriously enough. And I just don't think I saw the effort that I would have seen in years past with guys that really put emphasis about doing that obstacle course. And for, I'm happy that a guy like Spencer Dinwiddie won it, but I'm also a little disappointed about the the, the guys that participated because I just didn't feel like they were really putting their best effort forward um to kind of lead up to that that momentum of us buying into him winning it i'm not saying that spencer didn't deserve to win it and shouldn't have won it i'm just saying i really wasn't seeing much of anything from anyone else and i guess the only highlight was spencer dimwitty winning it yeah i i can see that I mean, because the the challenge is it's it's geared really for guards and and point guards of that of that ilk to kind of win it last year when they imp- implemented you know the big man rule uh, or big man versus versus guards type of thing, and you know it was it was a nice niche and nice nuance. But I think with this this crop as well too, especially guys like Andre Drummond and 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 even Laurie Markkinen going out there and trying to compete, like you know it was it just didn't really seem all all all. It that wasn't genuine. It just didn't seem. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you saw when Joel Embiid was like floundering around, um, you know, missed a dribble. He actually should have been disqualified because he didn't even actually put the ball through the the through the hoop, right? And, and the bounce pass, he just ba- basically bypassed that. So, I mean, how do you b- offer any form of credibility to this contest if you're not going to, you know what I'm saying? A, a guy has to play by the rules, you know? Then he comes back and he wins that one round. And I'm just like, it, <laughs> that's just a little ridiculous to me. So, again, I, you know. Yeah. Even he, no, I, even he knew that. You know, what I'm saying, I'm sure he was probably thinking, "You're not going to eliminate me." <laughs> so. Yeah, it was tough. You know, I think you know, and in that regard, it 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 didn't maybe really resonate the way it was. So Saturday night, in a, in, a, in a lot of ways, just didn't quite capture the same um, excitement that it has, or that they wanted it to in in recent years. Um, and like I said, especially with the skill challenge, we know it's an opening competition. It's it's the least exciting of the things that they pretty much do. Um, on Saturday night, uh, but in, in some ways, like I said, I when you look at it for holistically, a guy like Spencer Dinwiddie getting to get his shine out there was really impactful and really important, especially for a franchise that's obviously still struggling. You know, it doesn't have any real marquee players right now that that uh, the mainstream public can identify with. So for him to go out there and represent for his organization, I think was a great story. Now I will say this, um, with, with reference to Spencer Dinwiddie, again to your point, Shaw. You know he's the toast of Brooklyn right now. He, he's he. You know what I'm saying he's the man in he's the man in the bush right now, um, holding it down. Spencer Dinwiddie. So I'm happy for him. You know, with that regards, it will be very interesting because how do you gauge this, right? The, the, you could look at this particular event. You could look at who you had. I mean, clearly they're gonna they're gonna continue this again next year because they're gonna coax themselves into the belief that this still is a prop is 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 a popular. Uh, set up in order to to do that 
But I will say that I, I think it's going to wear itself, you know, very thin. I, I believe that the old, first of all, the skills challenge it in it in itself should have had the likes of some young guys that have that moniker where skills is it like the Lonzo balls. You know what I mean? Like I, I just want to see where it's being identified that these guys truly embody the premise of you having them participate in the skills challenge. And if they, if they're not going to do that, then they need to change, you know, the participant, like either the participants, they got to change the course uh, of the way they go about, you know, getting through it and, and, and getting through the rounds because I, I'm not completely buying into it. And I know it's going to wear, it's, it's going to wear itself very thin, very short. It's one of those few of those three Shaw that, you're going to always have to figure out something to make it interesting or else right. it's going to fizzle well, out very quickly. Well, I think, and not to cut you off, but I think in that situation, that's where you can do some of the more wackier ideas that you see out there, you know, with, with NBA All-Star Weekend, you know, kind of doing things that are kind of rock and jock style um, in some ways or form or fashion. You know what I mean? Whether, you know, they have to shoot like a, a crazy three point or a crazy shot, you know, shoot it, you know, 15 feet in the air or something like that, you know, like those types of, you know, just nuances and wackier things. Um, uh, like I said, I saw a different activation uh, for Foot Locker, ironically, where it was kind of like ski ball for, for for basketball. So you know how ski ball is, where you try to roll up the roll the ball up the up the up the ramp, and you try to get 10, 20, 30, 40, or fifty points, and then in the corners you have hundred points. So uh, they had a they had an activation where you were really, literally throwing a basketball, and the and the points were at different height levels. So, and it went up to like maybe say, I don't know, maybe 15 feet high where that was a 50 point if you could pass the ball into that, into that, into that, into that cylinder. So, I mean, like little things like that. I mean, and James Harden, it was his, it was a full locker Adidas activation. Harden went out there and, and worked it out. You know, like little kids were, you know, getting like maybe a hundred points in, you know, 30 seconds or whatever. He went up there and got like 400 points or something, something insane, you know, but those are the types of things that I think maybe you can bring to the competition that would make it a little bit more interesting because it's, it's also our weekend. Right. So and it's, it's not about real basketball. It's kind of about, you know, whatever. It's a skills challenge. So things like that kind of showcase some people's skills maybe a little bit differently. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, Sean. And, and, and again, this it's not to take away from the fact that, you know, people, the guys have participated, you know, they did their thing. But for that, most definitely gotta gotta make that gotta make that work. You're tuned to the baseline. Callie Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA as we are giving you our post NBA All Star Weekend coverage. All right, so let's go ahead and and focus our attention now to the three point challenge. You said it a little bit earlier, Shaw. Uh, definitely have has you know definitely fell short. Why would why would you believe that it actually fell short? You look at the you look at the list of the participants. It's not really a bad list. I mean, yeah, you know, Steph ain't um, St you know, Steph wasn't in it, um, and maybe there's still something to it because maybe in our minds we believe that the best shooter should always be participating in this. But you can only continue to do this, you know, so many times. And in my head. I'm just wondering where did they fall short? Is it just more so on the performance or was it because of now we're into the next, what is it? The second or the third year of the new formatting with, uh, with, uh, with how they set up the racks. I think this, I think this is the third year with uh, the, the complete money ball rack, having a complete money ball rack, you know, all five of those things worth the, worth multiple points. Um, I mean, you know, you can check the stats. I'm not exactly strong on that, but either way, um, it's funny when they go out here and, and you talk about, okay, well, new records are being set. Well, of course, new records are being set because you change the parameters of the rules. There's more actual points you can get as a result of it. So, um, you know, when Devin Booker sets a record, it's like, all right, well, all right. <laughs> you know, of course he would, uh, given that situation. But I'm not knocking his performance because it was pretty awesome in, in that final round. Um, I think in this situation, too, like you just kind of wonder – what what three point shooters do they want out there? Because I think it's a guy like Joe Ingles is also one of the league leaders in at least three point percentages this year. Um, he wasn't in the competition. I think he was tweeting and making some jokes, you know, about it. Hmm, you know, look at this, you know, as some people were going out there and bricking. Uh, Paul George had a, had a terrible showing, um, you know, obviously in, in the competition. Eric Gordon didn't live up to expectations as well either. So um, it, it's it's a like I said, it's an interesting thing because 
I, as a basketball fan, can appreciate watching good shooters, you know, shoot and, and you know, think a lot of they took a lot of uh, nuances into it. Especially, I think it was Brett Barry uh, who was breaking it down and talking about uh, the forms of everyone and you know, kind of where their best percentages uh, were shooting on the court. And so I got I got into all of that. Um, but just some people just didn't just didn't have it that night, and it was unfortunate to see that. You know, you want to see everybody at least put up. You know, I. I'd say maybe 17 to 18. Um, but when you guys have guys putting up nines and 12s and things of that nature, it's a little rough to watch. Yeah, definitely. I, I completely agree with you. And while, you know, look, I, I, I think you can, you can make the argument. Devin, Devin Booker saved his best for last. Um, and it was against, you know, Clay, right? So, I mean, it, you know, Clay Thompson, if not, the best shooter is the second best shooter, you know, for the three point contest, he arguably was the favorite to come into this situation. So at least we got to that. I think to your point is a little bit more excruciating when guys are just chucking shots and then just, you know what I'm saying? Bending iron all over the place because, you know, <laughs> they can't put it. Kyle Lowry too. Kyle Lowry was having a rough showing. Um, so, you know, again, it, it, it kind of goes with the territory. It's rough. I'm sure like in a perfect world, we want these guys to damn near be flawless, um, but you know, what can you say? All right. So, I mean, obviously now the, the end of the night we're talking about is the slam dunk contest. Um, I, I don't know where, where most people could go or should go with this. First of all, all the props in the world to Donovan Mitchell. I think he, I think he did a, you know, he did a great job. Um, all things considered, um, it just sucks. I, and, you know, this keeps happening, unfortunately, um, when there are opportunities to really have quality slam dunk competitions. Injuries, I think, take away from the luster. Um, you know, you can make the argument that if Zach Levine and Aaron Gordon were both participating, that this would have been probably the best in a slam dunk contest. A lot of people were, were trying to post this up to say that this was, you know, arguably one of the best slam dunk contests. As I'm like, I, I don't think so. Ooh, yeah. ooh saying that. Uh, they were trying to, they were trying to throw that because, of, because of the style of the dunks, right. Um, from, you know, mm. from Donovan, from Donovan Mitchell, but you'd be hard pressed to tell me from a competitive level that this was anything near, you know, some of the better slam dunk competitions that you and I have actually seen with our own two eyes, let alone what we've experienced watching on the television set. Right. So, um, you know, it's a missed opportunity because I think the injuries to Aaron Gordon and Zach Levine really dampered uh, our expectations about how exciting the slam dunk contest could potentially be. And it's hard because when you've got unknown guys, we've seen this before, Shaw, when, you know, key guys have been injured and unknowns have had to try and kind of hold the mantle up and try to get everybody all excited and focused on it, it's never there because they have already dampened their expectations about what to expect going into the slam dunk competition. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with that. You know, I think this, what was hard for me about it, like I said, and all kudos to Donovan Mitchell. He's a dope basketball player. I um, mean, overall, he deserved to win, but he didn't even have one of the two best dunks of the night. I think <laughs> those honors went to Dennis Smith Jr. and Larry Nance. Uh, junior. Ironically, I think those are the two best dunks of the evening. While Donovan Mitchell won it with, with you know, some nice dunks, but more or less overall consistency. Um, so, I mean, again, the format we know what it is with this. It, it's it's tough. Uh, I would have liked to see maybe more dunkers overall. Uh, this was a, a a nice crop because I had a lot, a lot of young guys who are and hopefully going to be the future and faces of the league in some way. Well, maybe not so much in the case of Larry Nance Jr. But you know, his tribute to his father was, I think, that was dope. It's a nice touch as well too. Uh, but I think next year. Uh, if, if Levine and, and Gordon are both back into it, uh, I'd love to see them get back in there and go at it, you know, head to head once again and, and maybe keep Mitchell back in this thing. And, and give and, and then they, I'd even invite Larry Nance and Dennis Smith back as well, too, because I think they did a great job. Oladipo is actually very creative. He tried some very difficult dunks. It just wasn't able to knock those down. So I'd like to see the uh, the, the field expand a little bit and maybe just change the, the format in terms of how the rounds go overall to kind of determine your winner. You know, Shaw, I, I got to tell you, have we gotten ourselves to a point where we're actually thinking about the slam dunk contest still being about the individual dunkers? Or are we going to start thinking about this along the same lines of what we just did with the NBA All-Star Game, which I'm sure we're going to talk about in a, in a, in a minute or two, um, with reference to how we format the, the way that we compete in doing this? Like, what, what, it, what would it be like if you had, you know, guys team together 
in order to compete against each other. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying just, you know, I know that they tried doing that sometime before they tried switching it up. But I mean, seriously, like it's not even just so much the, the, the slam dunk competitors amongst themselves anymore as much as the, the way that they're entertaining the fans and the, <clears throat> and, and the style and execution, you know, of of the dunks. You know what I mean? So, like, in other words, you 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 have like these 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 opportunities where um, Oladipo may team with a uh, uh, Zach Levine in 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 doing you know what I'm saying uh, a, a you know a, a a dunk style comp type thing between each other and stuff like. Do you think we're gonna get to that particular point? Because so much is is being made about how the slam dunk contest can can be high and it can be just I don't know if we'll ever get to the slam dunk being the way that it was some 10 12 years ago uh, unless you can buy into getting those generational players at first time that they are in the NBA to participate like the Ben Simmons of the of the world and things of that nature you get these guys in fresh within the first couple of years I feel like there's always going to be like this this roller coaster of effects when it comes to the NBA All Star Night, leaning heavily on the slam dunk competition to pull them through. Well, wasn't it a few years ago where they tried to do some sort of team competition, if you will? Um, you know, the 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 dunkers were. I feel like it was well, maybe not that recently because <laughs> I feel like it might have been Dallas or something like that. Where they try to say, okay, you know what, you know, you four guys are kind of on one team, and then you four guys are on another team, East versus the West, and then, um, you know, they still ended up kind of squaring off with still an individual winner. Now, if your concept is more saying that, like, like they're going to be judged as as a tandem per se, um, you know, maybe you know that could definitely be interesting. Um, but you know, how would you, how would you pick who your partners are or how would that be paired up? Because, you know, if anything, if Levine and Gordon get in there, it's like, all right, well, whatever, we're going to team up together and, and then the whole field is done. It's a, it's a wrap. Right. Um, so, so, you know, like I said, I think there's some, they, they're going to continue to try tweaks. They're not going to have this thing go away. Um, because it's one of those things like it's going to continue to be criticized no matter what they do. But the minute you don't have it, people are, are complaining and bitching about that as well. So, so they're damned if they do, damned if they don't either way. Um, and like I said, my only gripe with this whole thing is that I don't believe Donovan Mitchell had even one of the two best dunks of the evening, uh, but he was still the most consistent. What, what was your impressions about the Wakanda dunk? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, again, Oladipo, is a, he's, he's a showman, and he's a, he's a smart dude, intelligent guy um, who has a lot of creativity. Um, so if he would have been able to nail those things first try, um, it would have been, you know, it could have brought the house down in some ways. And he's a guy who I wouldn't mind seeing in it again to see if he could actually nail down some of these things because he had some high degree difficulty on, on, on his attempts. They just didn't go down for him. So, Shaw, you're playing this too light, man. First of all, while I thought it was all real slick and cool and everything, you know, he's walking around and he's like, you know what? I'm going to have me a Wakanda moment. Let me go ahead and go to my man, Chad, you know, Chad, Chadwick Boseman who just happens to have the Black Panther mask to give him, right? Wouldn't you carry it on you all the time? I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I'm just pulled. saying, right? Like, so my whole thing was, couldn't that, couldn't there have been like, a, like you shut the lights down and then you see like the Black Panther, you know what I'm saying? Signal come out or something or the Black Panther, like a sound effect come off or whatever. And then, you know, I mean, you remember, listen, we were there when Blake Griffin basically brought the house down during his slam dunk contest. And it wasn't as if the slam dunks themselves were so, like, you know what I'm saying, crazy. I mean, yes, jumping over the damn Kia thing, that was impressive. That was impressive, I will say that. But he did make it a little theatrical. And I'm just saying, you got to do right by the highest grossing Marvel movie in its, in its lifetime. On the, on the weekend that it comes out, right? That you're going to come out there and it's just like this eek the mouse moment. Like, hum, hum, cross stumps, and then go dunk the ball. Nah, man. Got to make that thing grandiose, man. Like coming to America grandiose if you're if you're Victor Oladipo and you're going to bring in our man, you know what I'm saying, T'Challa, involved in your slam dunk. You got to make that thing, 
theatrical. You got to make that thing royalty. I just felt they missed the mark on that, man. That's just me. No, I mean, and I don't, I don't think you're wrong. What, what ends up happening is a lot of those moments where they tried to bring, like exactly what you said, those theatrics, that, that excitement to it. Um, and, and again, it, when you go up there and miss your <laughs> miss an attempt and everyone sees what you're trying to do, it, it just takes away from it. And that's, that to me at the end of the day is like, I don't know what that, what that boils down to is, is it nerves? You know, how does it, how does that affect your hops? Because I, I assume these are dunks that you've tried and that you have nailed before you're not going out there and completely freestyle on this thing. So, so for me, that's where, it, where it does miss the mark. But I, a lot of them, they, they did try and even Donovan Mitchell, you know, with the Vince Carter and everything like that as well, too. Uh, again, it wasn't nearly as as dope as Vince Carter was back in the day, but that's because we're X amount of years removed from that. So, and then he just, he kind of just barely got over the rim as well, too, on that attempt. So, again, the effort is there. They see that they need to bring creativity and showmanship to the competition. They do see that, um, but the execution is just something that they all have to work on collectively. Uh, well, n- in, in not just execution, Shaw, personality. You know, I- Look, these guys are are great NBA players. They're great ambassadors for the sport and great ambassadors for their community. But they're going to be who they are. And you're asking them to do something that I just think that some people, they just have it. And some people, they just don't. Now, Victor Oladipo, you look at him, really mild-mannered, kind of a jokester. He didn't have that stigma you know what i mean like like he like you know, remember when you saw dominique get ready to do his dunk it's like it's either his dunk spoke or his personality spoke either way you as a fan were in it all the way until the very end he could have missed 30 dunks that would have been fine because dominique wilkins is who he is right he's the human highlight reel right vince carter Vince Sanity, the whole, the mantra, even though he didn't miss dunks, if he had missed it, you would not have cared because Vince Carter just oozed slam dunk persona. And I feel like that is what's happening with some of the guys that they're bringing into the slam dunk contest. I'm not saying that they got to be, you know, this extraordinary, but I got to feel like they want to be in it. And I know they want to be in it because of how hard they practice and the type of dunks but there's a disconnect in the way that they're engaging the fans' enthusiasm about wanting to be a part of this dunk contest. Just flailing your your hands up and around in the air saying, come on, show us some love. Like, no, you don't do that. You you go out there and you take it from them, right? You, You basically snatch the crowd's ignorance of not buying into you being in that slam dunk contest. And I think that's where a lot of those guys are missing the mark. Remember Nate Robinson? See, a lot of people didn't want to give Nate his 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 props, but he quickly reminded people about the Spud Web, the Spud Webs, and the Muggsy Bogues in this world when this kid would come up and he elevate. And I think that was what bought him so many opportunities to go up and fail, dunk after dunk after dunk, because of this elevation, because of his persona. And I just feel like some of those guys are missing that. And this was a great, great opportunity on a weekend of weekends like this, where you had all of the elements in play. Marvel movie coming out. Marvel involved with the NBA. You got all the legends out there. You know what I'm saying? And and it's just a lot of momentum riding out there. And the stars are shining bright. And it's just has this mundane feel because some of the guys, they just their personality just they just keep it lock and key. And it's only unlike they win like an NBA playoff game that you suddenly see some form of excitement from them. I get it. I really do. I I, I understand that. And you know, it, like you, then you just have to the NBA is gonna have an interesting job of trying to figure out uh I can't believe we're gonna who, have to have a a, a a a slam dunk talent show. Like <laughs> You have to have tryouts uh, in order for these but guys. I mean, to- but in in some ways, that's what it boils down to. Because then you got to figure out who can bring the talent, who also has a personality. And I think Donovan Mitchell was is a great example of he does have the both. And even Oladipo, had he been able to complete his dunks, he has a talent and he definitely has a personality. You know, but he he didn't have execution on Saturday night. Um, so I think this is something that they'll continue to to evaluate. Um, but one thing I will say, you know, kind of closing off the slam dunk co- co- conversation. Um, Zach Levine on the on the broadcast was you know he was awesome you know that kid is a, is a gr- highly intelligent individual um, definitely a student of the game student of the competition he know he he could reference things that you know I don't think the the, the smartest or the most uh, 
in tune basketball fans would even remember. He, like even to the point when Vince Carter made one dunk and he was hopping around afterwards. He's like, yo, he didn't he didn't have the complete flair. Zach Levine, man, a true student of the of the slam dunk competition. So it would be great to be able to have him back out there in Charlotte next I year. I hope they do that. And I and again, I, I, I is it just me, Shaw, or was like the whole players only thing a little bit too much? I'm not I'm not touching players only, man. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it is it because is it because your boy you know what I'm saying is 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 the head honcho on that like you you know what I'm saying he's he's the head. Well, shout out shout out C Webb he's gonna you know gonna okay. as now, once again a finalist for the Hall of Fame you know that that was announced over the weekend as well too but the players only thing it's a, it's a little overdrawn sometimes it's a, it's a lot of yelling and screaming um and it doesn't seem like there's a whole a lot of analysis on there but when they do get serious it that can actually be pretty good content but. There, it's just some guys trying to have a good time. So, you know, and so, and especially in All-Star Weekend, you can't really expect anything more than that. All right. All right, Sean. So let's go ahead and round out our conversation with regards to the NBA All-Star game. It was a very compelling basketball game. Um, high scoring again. I mean, you know, what more else can be said? Uh, but what were your thoughts about the game in itself and the format? Did you like it, love it, or shove it? That was pretty good. I think what ended up happening, especially to begin the, begin the, the first quarter, there was – some real deep, deep down competition going on. Uh, defense was play, was being played at a higher level. It wasn't at you know regular NBA game level, but it was definitely higher than anything would have been than, than previous years. Um, and that kind of set the tone. So yeah, there was lulls where you know it wasn't nearly quite as highly competitive or serious. Um, and then some All Stars aren't that exciting to watch. And you know, it's not a knock on them; they're still very talented. Um, but they don't bring the oohs and the ahs out of the crowd or even the, the the audience watching on television the way that some of the other players do. Uh, but overall, and especially with you know, the main guys being in there down the stretch, um, the game going down to the last second shot, um, it had all the drama and all the things that the NBA could have wanted, especially after the debacle that was last year. I think it did work in terms of having St- Team LeBron and Team Stefan. Uh, yes, they want to broadcast the draft next year and all that. Like Like that to me is... Kind of irrelevant. It's just something to talk about in that moment. Uh, I don't really care. I think it's about what ends up happening in the game anyway. Um, and, and I think in this situation, it worked out. So they definitely will not be changing it. It will stay the same for next year and maybe even a couple years after that. Well, I care. Uh, you know, I care about it because if you're going to change the rules, at least make sure that everybody has, you know, eyes on, you know, what, yeah, what well, I'm in, I'm in, for it. You I'm in I mean? favor of them doing yeah. it, but it doesn't <laughs> make or break me that they don't. Like, I, it doesn't, I don't think it, decreases the value of what ends up happening on Sunday night. If the game is still trashed, then who cares who got drafted? <laughs> so, you know, or, and where they got drafted. The, the important part is that the game is actually worth watching. And that, I think tonight that proved that. Well, I, I get where you're coming from. So I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to take from that particular point. I think where that might, might lend itself and might, might play itself differently, maybe is in in the way that we're saying this is being, you know, set up. Um, you know, you have an interesting combination of quote unquote team Steph with Mike Nantoni as the coach. And then you have this, you know, team LeBron, right. Um, in, in which you have, you know, Dwayne, Dwayne Casey as the coach. So I guess my point is, is that when these guys do get drafted and they're under a particular coach and system and stuff like that, I do think that those things kind of play itself well, because we often talk about how the player, you know, the, the coach translates to the player, you know, to the team. Um, you know, to me, I, I, if they're going to be this competitive, I think at some point it is going to filter itself out on how these guys do get drafted because you want the guys that you want to situate yourself with the best opportunities to win. The reason why I like this format specifically is because it did bring out that whole the bigs versus, you know, the, the Davids versus the Goliaths, so to speak. And for the most part, you know, the Davids looked like they were about to, you know, run away with this thing. And then somehow the Goliaths, Beat the, the beat the Davids with the same style of play that we expected the, the the Davids if they were expecting to win this game wound up doing it, which is hitting the three ball. Because down the stretch, the you know the Goliaths were hitting some key threes and got some quick turnovers uh, in order for them to give themselves a chance to win that game. Yeah, I can I can see that for sure, and it's ironic. I didn't realize until the game started that I know a lot of jokes have been made about Team LeBron. A lot of his his main guys going down, and especially with the bigs per se, you know, the cousins, the loves of the world, et cetera, et cetera. But that Curry's team was pretty much uh, unaffected. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, he was pretty much good money. I think the only uh, downside he has, I think it was Jimmy Butler who was unable to play because he was under the weather. And a lot of people attribute, it, attribute that to him hanging out in L.A. all weekend. So he just wasn't really up 
uh, to going out there and, 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 and being competitive under the spotlight, if you will. But overall, what, what you see in a situation like this is uh, LeBron James is the, the, the leader and you know, in, in, in all things NBA right now. Uh, and he kind of talked to the guys, I think collectively, and said, hey, we're going to go out here and, and make this a game that people want to watch. Uh, the league itself, too, by allowing uh, uh, upping the purse for each player or for the winning team, rather. And then, you know, the, the, the great, uh, great initiative, which they've always had, too, in terms of the charity organizations being a part of things as well, too. So overall, they did a great job in cleaning this up and making a much better and consumable product for all of us to watch and enjoy. Um, the, the question is, OK, well, can they improve on it? And if so, what ends up happening? Because my only concern is like, well, does it become like a repeat of the NBA Finals? You know, it's oh, is it going to be Team LeBron versus Team Steph again next year? Um, and chances are, with fan voting, that's pretty much what we're going to be looking at. Um, so my my thing would be cool if there was a different dynamic in terms of maybe some different coaches getting an opportunity. Not just that, and I and 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 I, and I like the point that you made because I think it raises another question, Shaw. What happens after Team LeBron? You know what I mean? Like Team Steph, it's definitely there. But what happens after the after Team LeBron? Like what about like well, maybe what about Team Russ, right? Like I, it would be very interesting to see how we you know encompass you know the 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 focal point of the guys that make the NBA what it is, and we're putting them in this particular you know scenario like this situation here about the NBA All Star Weekend. I just think it comes down to a level of, of respect, and if LeBron James is saying, "Hey, we need to make this a better product." You know, it's for us, obviously, and it's for the people that are paying for this. A lot of those guys are going to buy into it. Can we honestly say that there are guys on in that locker room that have the same resounding effect as a LeBron James? And you're, to your point, y'all, I don't know if we're going to ever know that until we see these guys actually step up in moments outside of that. It'll be very interesting to see because I'm completely fine with it if it does happen again like this next year because I think a component is going to be about the players that are going to be a part of this equation. But I will say that to your point, if we're talking about a guy like LeBron James and maybe even a person like Steph Curry is the only ones that have a, re a resonating or a resounding voice that people buy into what they're trying to say and do for the better of not just themselves, the players, and the, the league, there will be a serious gap that have to be made up very quickly if we don't start seeing those type of people kind of stepping out and doing it a little bit more consistently. Yeah, the only thing that I think that can maybe alter that, I guess I want to say that destiny in some way is, and I'm not wishing this on anybody, is one, an injury. Or if they decided to go ahead and just say it's going to be the two highest vote getters, no matter what, will get to be team captains. They still go ahead and give the top five players from each conference, you know, starting nods per se. Um, but in the eventuality, and the only, only person that could really catch them potentially would be would potentially be Durant. You know, in terms of his overall po popularity, but you know, all that kind of gets muted with him being on the same team as Curry. Uh, but I think that is something that, if it's just a matter of hey, the two top vote getters, uh, you know, and again, hopefully nobody is injured as a result, like how Giannis was leading LeBron for the first for the first ballot results. You know, that would have been great. You know, but it, I think it'd be dope if it was you know Team LeBron versus Team Durant or whatever. You know, ends up being Giannis versus whoever. You know, in in, in subsequent years, but. Those two guys, in terms of LeBron James and Stephen Curry, they still have some years left in the league, obviously, and obviously more so in the case of Curry, uh, where I think their popularity is going to always uh, command the vote of the vote getters out there. I mean, or the voters out there. Yeah, it's it's it, again. It I to me, I just think that right now, off to a really good start. We got a really Absolutely. great game. Um, obviously, you know, you don't even honestly, you didn't even think too much about it being as high scoring an affair as it was, because really, for the first three quarters, it seemed. You know, like they were on a level, you know, no, the first half, it looked like, okay, they're about to score about 160. And then the second half, you clearly saw that there was a little bit more emphasis in defense. I think they, you know, I think the third quarter is really the lowest points of, of between the, of the four that they scored. Um, and then they really amped it up. And, and defensively, again, I think it's what we've always been talking about. When they play at least a little bit of defense, it, it gives us the impression that at least they're trying. You know, they want to make it out like they, they actually – what either side wants to win, but at least want to look good winning and look good losing. And that actually that, that final play locking down Steph Curry, I'm sure a lot of guys are sitting there saying, damn, why don't we do that whenever we're playing against Golden State? <laughs> 
Yeah, I like that too. <laughs> so I think what we're going to see moving forward, honestly, um, you know, is is these players taking it more seriously. And I think they understand that this was a good product to watch. Unlike the beginning of the game uh, with Kevin Hart and, and then Fergie doing whatever the hell it is that they were doing, uh, the game itself kind of made up for some of the lackluster things that the NBA was trying to do uh, to, to – to hype it up in some. And sometimes you just got to roll the ball out there and let them play and not worry about so much about the fluff. Uh, so I'm excited to see how this progresses and moves forward. And maybe we do get a little bit different result, but um, I'll just but just improving on what we saw this year. Definitely. Well, once again, we'd like to give big shout outs to LeBron James. He again became the NBA All-Star MVP. I believe this is his third time around. And Team LeBron edge out a victory against Team Steph. Uh, 148, 145. Great, great show altogether, Shaw. Comprehensive discussion uh, from beginning to end. I'm sure that you're regretting that you're going to have to make your way back over to the East Coast, albeit the temperatures may not fluctuate too differently from you from L.A. to Fort Lauderdale. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, you're you're getting yourself back in the fold to be well-rested for this final stretch of NBA that we're going to need to cover. Oh, you know it, man. I can't wait to get back and get right back in the trenches and, and start talking about regular basketball again. You know, we'll have a couple of days off here before the season resumes. I believe it's uh, Thursday of the of the, of the upcoming week. Um, but either way, man, you know, we you know we're going to be here to cover it, all the stuff. Watch what ends up happening with the, these buyout candidates as, as we approach the March 1st deadline as well. And then we'll be having some discussion about what these teams are going to be looking like to close out the season. Bro. So can't wait, man. Um, and I couldn't do it without you, brother. So let's let's get to it and finish the season strong like the NBA always does. Brother. Most definitely. So once again, we'd like to thank you and yours for tuning in for our NBA All-Star post-game, uh, post-weekend coverage. For the baseline, Cali Warrenshaw. We appreciate you guys. You know we do. We'll catch up with you next time.